Good morning and welcome to the New School and to this tw 32nd conference, I can't believe it, of social research on the fear of art, which was certainly eerily well-timed. Of course, Charlie Hebdo happened uh, very recently and this conference has been in the planning for over a year. And we wish it, it, it wasn't as well-timed as it turned out to be. Let me say a word about social research, uh, which is the journal of the New School for Social Research and has been since 1934, when it was begun by Alvin Johnson, the first president of the New School, with a small group of exiled scholars and intellectuals whom he had managed with great foresight to bring out of Germany to the New School, not only to the New School, but a, a cadre of them came to the New School it was a way to provide them with a, ha a haven from what was beginning to happen uh, in Germany and in Europe. Most of those he brought here had already lost their academic positions with the imposition of racial laws. This group became known as the University in Exile uh, in 1933 and became the graduate faculty of the New School for Social Research in 1934 and more recently was renamed the New School for Social Research. It, it, the name business at the New School has become a joke, I think. I, I mean, why they want to change names all the time, I don't know. It was Alvin Johnson who believed that the faculty needed a journal which would be its public voice and to, it was to serve that goal that he and the small group of exiled faculty began the journal. And it was with that in mind that I began the Social Research Conference Series in 1988. In fact, we are celebrating the 80th anniversary of the journal this April with uh, Michael Ignatieff, Peter Wittig, who's German ambassador to the United States, and Fritz Stern. Our mission from the start has been to foster the discussions of matters of very serious public concern by exploring these issues in terms of their immediate import and whenever possible, their historical context. Papers from the conferences, all of them, become journal uh, uh, issues of, special issues of social research which can be ordered in the lobby. Since 2010, the conference series has been organized under the auspices of our Center for Public Scholarship, which is a, 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 a virtual center at the New School and, and actually now at NSSR, at the New School for Social Research, which is intended to be a kind of intellectual crossroads for academics, students, and pu the public and policymakers. Now to today's conference and a word about our choice of topic, which probably doesn't need too much explaining. We selected the theme for the conference because freedom of, ex of expression remains, as is perfectly clear, under threat in both totalitarian and democratic states, as we were reminded all too horrifically only a few weeks ago. Artists continue to be continued to be imprisoned and exiled, and art continues to be banned and destroyed, all of which gives evidence to the power of images to unsettle, to speak truth to power, to question our uh, cherished cultural norms and what we hold sacred. Our speakers during the next two days will examine the history of art censorship and the role of artists as collaborators and rebels. The agenda also, as uh, not uh, always, but we have made a big effort to pair artists and scholars to discuss activist art and the threat posed by art. Museums and gallery directors will also discuss who does the policing and ask what is the role of self-censorship. I would like to point something out to you and I'm gonna do it uh, periodically during this conference. We have uh, picked up on a idea that was launched by Ai Weiwei at his Alcatraz exhibit, which is a postcard campaign. Weiwei uh, designed extraordinarily beautiful postcards, very benign, they are beautiful flowers. And uh, he created a book. And the book lists 
not so much only artists, but dissidents who have been imprisoned uh, for uh, on, on sort of the human rights activists who have been imprisoned. And what he is asking and what we are asking our audiences to do is to look at the book and you are asked, if you wish, to write a short message to one of these um, endangered dissidents and uh, we will then deal with the mailing of them. So there's a the whole stack of these Ai Weiwei, quite beautiful postcards. And then on top of that, we have our own postcards with the fear of art, uh, which, which is the fear of art uh, picture of our program with Ai Weiwei holding it. And we have collected through Amnesty and Index on Censorship and other organizations, uh, human rights organizations, a list of endangered artists, and we ask you, we, we have information about them out in the lobby, we ask you to do exactly what Ai Weiwei has asked, namely to write a few words, to choose one of the uh, these endangered or imprisoned or even disappeared uh, artists uh, as a way of showing our support and, know, and to let them know that the world is watching. And uh, so, this conference, like all its predecessors, would never have been possible without the generous support and advice from knowledgeable people. I am deeply grateful to our advisors who helped craft this agenda and to our funders. The conference has been made possible with the generous support from Agnes Gund, the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, Larry Warsh, the Ford Foundation, and Arte East. The conference is also co-sponsored by the Viralist Center here for Art and Politics here at the New School and Pan America and the in India China Institute here at the New School. I'm gonna uh, hold off saying anything else because I'm eating up their time and I know that's a bad idea. So let me introduce our moderator for today, uh, Vic Navasky. Vic was editor and publisher of The Nation for many years. He's a chaired professor at the Columbia University School of Journalism. Uh, he has books, uh, many important books, uh, uh, one that many of you may have read, uh, Naming Names, which won a National Book Award, uh, Mission Accomplished, or How We Won the War in Iraq, A Matter of Opinion, which won the 2005 George Polk Book Award and the 2006 Anne M. Sperber Prize. And very recently, he authored Political Cartoons and Their Enduring Power, which makes him the ideal moderator for this session of the conference. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Adrian. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna say a few words by way of uh, introduction to the subject. Then I'm gonna introduce you to our panelists. Then each of them will have, will speak briefly for maybe five minutes about a question, they'll answer a question I ask them. And then we're gonna have a discussion among ourselves and then we, we're gonna open it up to all of you. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here, and I appreciate that warm introduction. Um, you know, uh, I was brought up to think that cartoons and caricatures and comic strips were trivial and irrelevant and uh, something and a waste of time, and my teachers thought I should be doing my homework. My parents thought I should be doing my homework and not reading the comics. On the other hand, Charlie Hebdo comes along and the massacres, obviously, c comics and cartoons and caricatures speak to, you know, visual language speaks with a power of its own. And this is not something new. Uh, the Charlie Hebdo episode to me was a rerun of something that happened 10 years ago with the Danish Mohammeds when a group of Danish cartoonists did caricatures of Mohammed and uh, if you recall what happened that across Asia and Europe, hundreds of thousands of Muslims took to the streets in protest. Embassies were shut down, ambassadors were recalled in Pakistan. Protesters burned Danish flags and worldwide the protesters killed more than 100 people and all of that. 
Um, it's, so it's not a surprise, and I'll tell you as the editor of The Nation, you just heard I was there for 30 years, only once in 30 years did the staff march on my office with a petition demanding that we not publish something, and that something was a cartoon by the late, great David Levine. It was a brilliant cartoon, which I won't waste your time by talking about now. Uh, but secondly, it wasn't, it's not just me and the nation, obviously. Let me just read you one brief paragraph about what happened with uh, when the ambassador, Lord Halifax, from Great Britain, went, met with the uh, Garbles, the Minister of Propaganda in Germany, and uh, asked them, they had banned the Evening Standard from appearing in Germany, and he asked them, what, we, what can we do to get the Evening Standard back and, and improve relations between the countries? And they said, stop printing the cartoons of David Lowe, and here's what he said about that. You cannot, and there was a great British cartoonist, David Lowe, and he said, you cannot imagine the frenzy these cartoons cause. As soon as a copy of the Evening Standard arrives, it is pounced on for Lowe's cartoon, and if it is Hitler, which it usually is, telephones buzz, tempers rise, fevers mount, and the whole governmental system of Germany is in an uproar. It is hardly subsided before the next one arrives. We in England can't understand the violence of the reaction. So um, it's not a surprise there. And in our own country, famously in New York City, Boss Tweed of Tammany Hall said about the cartoonist Thomas Nast, he said, I don't care what they write about me, my constituents can't read, but they can't help seeing them damn pictures. Get rid of them damn pictures. And then ironically, Boss Tweed was under indictment and he was recognized by a customs official in Spain from the cartoons and caricatures about him and they picked him up and, and he ended up going to prison along with other members of, of the Tammany Ring. So there are, uh, you know, there are, could do, go down the history of cartoonists who've run into problems. Um, Daumier was thrown into prison, the great Honoré Daumier, and it, as was his publisher. Um, I'm not gonna get into that now. I wanna get to our panelists. There are reasons, why should this be so? There are religious reasons given no graven images. There are anthropological reasons given. Primitive people thought that pictures were alive. So-called primitive people thought that pictures were alive. There are neurological reasons, neuroscience. There's a whole new field called neuroaesthetics, which says that these, the way to understand why cartoons cause such an upset is to study the brain, not what's in the cartoons. That's their view, it's, it doesn't have to be my view. I have my own theory, we can talk about it when we get there. So let me just say very briefly, your panelists are described in, in your program, but I wanna welcome them all and thank them all for being with us this morning. And uh, say briefly, Ben Catcher, who is sitting immediately on my left, is a MacArthur Award-winning cartoonist and associate professor at Parsons at the New School, and, and he will talk to you, and, and I will ask him and the rest of the panelists their question, and uh, we are very fortunate that he is with us. Uh, Nick Kausar is, the uh, I believe, the only panelist on the panel who has gone to prison for the cartoons that he has drawn in Iran, and, and we'll hear about that this morning. Alexandra Sigmund, uh, if, if I've got the order right, uh, is the New York Times Deputy Art Director of the Opinion Section, and you know, the New York Times chose not to republish the cartoons uh, from Charlie Hebdo, and we may hear about that or not. If, it did, if we don't hear about it and you wanna hear about it, you can ask her about it in the question period. And uh, it's uh, a, and then, and then we have Sadia Tour is the Associate Professor of Sociology and Anthropology at the College of Staten Island, and she um, is the author of The State of Islam, Culture, and Cold War Politics in Pakistan, and she can give us her own perspective. So we're very grateful to have all of you with us, and let me just ask one question for all of you, but feel free to go beyond it in your five minutes uh, for starters, and then we'll have our own conversation. My basic question is, 
What was your first reaction when you heard about the murders at Charlie Hebdo and, and what happened there, and, how, and, and then your subsequent thoughts about that? So thank you. Why don't you come up here one by one, and we'll get to know you. Well, I was, um, I'm not a regular reader of Charlie Hebdo, but I was following um, the, uh, the recent history in the last 10 years, the firebombing in 211 of their offices and the trial in 2007 um, for defaming the Muslim community. Um, and so, um, I can't say I was surprised. They were under the editor and, and some of the staff were under police protection. So I, I can't say I was surprised uh, when I heard that. Uh, I was worried about a friend of mine who works for them occasion, and he, he wasn't there, uh, the cartoonist Wilhelm. And um, I know two of the cartoonists were, were um, uh, Kabu was 75 and uh, Wolinsky was 80. These people had very long careers um, and worked for a lot of um, newspapers and magazines and published their own books. And this, um, the idea of making pictures of uh, Muhammad is a tiny part of their career. I mean, it's, um, and so, I guess for that reason, I felt like um, they shot the wrong people. They attacked the wrong magazine. There are right, horrible, racist, right-wing magazines in France that you know uh, were not attacked. And I thought there was a confusion of f uh, free speech absolutists with racism, and that's a complicated issue and it's easy to confuse the two um, ideas and um, that's what I thought uh, they, they shot the wrong people but you know and they you know they didn't shoot the magazine they shot individual cartoonists they didn't the magazine is doing better than ever so it didn't affect uh, the idea of this magazine it's more than the, few of the people at that meeting, so that's what I thought. Great, thank you. Nick, you wanna? Uh, <clears throat> First of all, let me tell you, I'm a Muslim light, uh, <laughs> an alcohol drinking, bacon eating, non-practicing Muslim. <laughs> but I understand some things about the uh, Muslim communities. I'm coming from Iran. Uh, in Iran, you can see paintings of the Prophet Muhammad. So if you hear that oh, uh, it's not allowed to draw or portray the Prophet or the Imams, uh, under, let's say, the Shiite uh, government of Iran, we've, we've published hundreds of thousands of posters of the Prophet, but not cartoons or caricatures of uh, the Prophet. So everyone over there is an unlight Muslim regarding this thing. Uh, I believe that, uh, first of all, the radical Islamists are the ones to blame for drawing a caricature of this type of Islam. So if they want to blame anyone, they're not supposed to uh, blame the cartoonists who are just portraying what they have done. Uh, when I heard the news, it was a great shock because it wasn't just the four cartoonists, the staff cartoonists working there. There was another cartoonist over there, the fifth one, and then the staff working, and then the policemen. So all were killed, and then uh, later we, un we learned that uh, they wanted to be sure they had killed the, the, r the right people in their uh, point of view. Um, as somebody who has received several death threats in Iran, I can say it's uh, fearful to work under that situation because you don't know uh, how they would uh, react to your next cartoon. I had made fun of uh, the murderers who had assassinated intellectuals in Iran and had compared them to the brothers of Joseph, son of Jacob. And I was uh, getting a sentence 
that could have actually ended uh, uh, in, let's say, uh, life sentence or even execution for making fun of Quran, the holy book, because I had used a part about sinners. I mean, the people, the brothers wanted to get rid of their beloved brother Joseph. So uh, the judge who was known as the butcher of the press in Iran said that you, it's right you made fun of the wrong people, but you were not supposed to talk about Quran in a cartoon. And I hadn't even mentioned Quran. I had just mentioned the story of the brothers of Joseph who threw him in a well. So that didn't go very well. And in my very good days at Evin Prison, it's a very lovely place. Um, I slept, I think, 14 hours a day over there, had the best food for a long time. And then after that, my real prison started for three and a half years, receiving threats, being interrogated, until I had to leave the country in 2003 and had to leave my wife and daughter behind for four years until they joined me in Canada. And I was lucky for that. But uh, the thing is, uh, the sad part of being a cartoonist in the uh, Middle East or North Africa region is that if uh, cartoonists become targets, they have to self-censor themselves. And that's dangerous for the art, that's dangerous for the craft, for the business of editorial cartooning. And what I'm uh, scared right now is that like a few days ago, I heard that a cartoonist in uh, the Palestinian territories was fired because of uh, Mahmoud Abbas's dismay of a cartoon he had drawn. This will happen more and more in different countries in the MENA region. And I'm worried that uh, the backlash of the uh, Charlie Hebdo massacre would also massacre cartoons, not cartoonists. And this is the sad part that we at Cartoonist Rights Network are trying to battle with the help of cartoonists uh, from North America and then uh, cartoonists in Europe and uh, the MENA region. Thank you. Great, thank you, Nick. Alexander. Hi. Uh, so, my first experience um, upon hearing about the event was that soon after uh, we received a company-wide injunction against uh, republishing the cartoons in any way. Um, and so, you know, this, to me, this decision, I was not directly involved in this decision. Um, I know that it took place over a long period of time um, within a boardroom and it was a very complex conversation. Um, and that the, the decision felt difficult to a lot of the people involved. Um, for me personally, this is the, uh, the type of conversation that is quite familiar to me at the times. Um, as an art director working with the editors, uh, frequently I'm having to uh, commission artwork on topics that are difficult and dangerous and potentially offensive. So. Um, these are mostly religious topics, I think, that cause this sort of discomfort. Um, and I would say, for example, just recently, maybe a week ago, I was uh, uh, commissioning an illustration on um, Catholicism and divorce. And the image that I had gotten from the artist showed a broken rosary. Um, and talking about this with the editors, perhaps they were much more sensitive, given what had just happened. Um, but they found this broken rosary to be potentially offensive. And I found that to be really interesting and, and quite sensitive, but also thinking about it further, it brought up this interesting question about when something is a mere object and when it is a symbol. Um, and so it seemed that the rosary is not just an object, but also a symbol of faith. Um, and so that just brings interesting uh, thoughts onto this whole issue of religious representation. and. Um, you know, what I thought was interesting about this whole issue is, is this issue of representing Mohammed um, and representing religious figures in general. Um, and I do intuitively somewhat understand this basic injunction against, you know, in some parts of Islam against representing Mohammed, almost because I, I am curious about how one should represent 
religious ideas and religious figures um, just because there is something metaphorical or abstract about them. And so should they actually be represented through a figure or actually more, you know, I know that Mohammed sometimes was represented as a flame or with a veil over his head. And to me, this actually is a quite interesting issue. Um, should one represent ideas of religion metaphorically rather than through figuration? And does that actually get more to some sort of core idea of spir spirituality than showing a figure? Um, so to me, these were the types of issues that became very interesting. Um, I lead a workshop sometimes where I ask students to represent their idea of God visually as fast as they can. And, and I see what they create, and oftentimes they create totally metaphorical images. They do use um, flames, or perhaps like a tiny door in a large expanse of white, or um, a sun, or ideas of the clouds or luminosity. And so, um, yeah, I guess I'm just interested in, in various depictions of religion and this whole issue that Charlie Hebdo uh, brought up um, was all tied into that, of how artists represent these images and symbols. Great, thank you. Sadia. Hi. Um, so, it's a tough question. Sort of a minefield. Um, so, I heard about the uh, tragic events of Charlie Hebdo uh, when I was in Pakistan. And um, because I was jet lagged, um, it was at some absurd hour of the morning that I was doing what I normally do when I'm jet lagged, is like obsessively going to Facebook. And um, suddenly saw uh, my Facebook feed and my Twitter feed just full of the hashtag that we've all become familiar with, as well as, of course, responses to it, um, declarations of I am Charlie and, and uh, refutations of that. And of course, in my jet lag state, and also because I had no idea really, and here I'm pleading uh, I'm, I'm sort of sharing my ignorance. I had no idea what Charlie Hebdo was. I was like, what? who is this Charlie Hebdo and what has happened? And um, so I had to, as one often has to do in these cases, um, educate myself very quickly. And uh, the fact that, so, so obviously once uh, it began to sink in what had happened, my reaction was obviously one of horror um, at the incident itself, at the violence, um, at the planned nature of the attack, the, the cold-blooded nature of the attack. Um, but also, um, quickly following on that was a horror of what had happened to public discourse, right? Um, and I'm talking now about uh, people who are my Facebook friends. You know, of course, we know that Facebook friends are not necessarily intimate friends, but they are a community of sort, right? And you tend to think of that as some kind of a safe space. At least, foolishly, I do. Um, and so, um, for me, uh, the, the questions and the, the, the level um, at which the discussion was taking place uh, was really the tragedy that followed the tragedy, the foreclosing of certain kinds of debates, uh, certain kinds of attempts at um, countering a certain decontextualized understanding of what had happened um, at Charlie Hebdo. And also, you have to, I mean, there's no reason, unfortunately, you would know this, or perhaps you would. Um, this was also playing out against the context of um, the horrifying attack on the um, army school in Peshawar in which um, hundreds of children had been brutally murdered. And the, the fallout of that, again, from very liberal sections of civil society, progressive elements in uh, civil society in Pakistan, was a bloodlust uh, for um, anyone who could be defined as a terrorist. And these things are very fraught in Pakistan. Who gets to be defined a terrorist? And, and um, among other things, a call for uh, military courts and summary executions, which actually uh, public executions, which did actually take place in Pakistan after many, many, many years. I think the last time we had had a public execution was under the very brutal military regime of Zia ul Haq um, in the 1980s. And so, for me, the this all of this sort of brings forward um, 
things that we really need to discuss. These are difficult questions, difficult issues. And, and uh, I don't have time in this, in this maybe in this five minute, um, uh, you know, first go, but maybe in the discussion that follows, I'll try and get at them. Well, number one, um, this question, uh, what I was perturbed by, or rather disturbed by, was this idea that seemed to be floating um, that the appropriate way or the only authentic way um, of proving or showing that you actually abhorred what had happened in the offices of Charlie Hebdo was to declare that you were Charlie, and that meant also signing on to anything and everything that they had published, right? And that also seemed to include the need to circulate some of the most offensive images. And perhaps I have a very select um, you know, uh, community to draw from, and I'd be happy if, if people uh, saw things differently. But all the images I saw were um, the images that pertain to Muslims and to quote unquote Islam. And so quickly it became not just a question of the right to offend in this sort of unilateral, um, equal opportunity way, but because the attack came from Islamist terrorists, the need to circulate the, the extremely disturbing images um, of, you know, of Muslims or Islam, um, quote unquote. And I think that is something that we really need to think about or talk about because it's easy to take a position uh, when you are saying cartoons, should they be banned, should they not be banned, should be censored, should they not be censored, um, and talk about you know, even cartoons that Charlie Hebdo has done in the abstract. And it's a very different thing, I think, to be confronted with the images themselves um, because these are not images you know, of the Prophet Muhammad, just images of the Prophet Muhammad, because that, that is also what part of the conversation becomes. Oh, does, it's because Islam forbids images of the Prophet Muhammad, and as we just heard from Nick, that's not um, necessarily the case for the entire Muslim world, and certainly not for the entirety of Muslim history. So I think that, um, you know, one needs to, when one is having this conversation, be attentive not just to the broader question um, of freedom of speech, which obviously all reasonable people um, want to um, hold on to and want to protect and want to and do so very vociferously. But let's face it, we all know that this freedom of speech or the absolutism uh, of this position of freedom of speech is something that can really only be held in the ideal. It doesn't really exist in life, right? It doesn't really exist in, in the world that we live in. And we live in a country that consistently imp infringes on the free speech rights of particular groups of people and particularly Muslims. And this is happening, has been happening in France as well. So that provides a broader context, I think, against which to think about um, not the violent attack on Charlie Hebdo, but the, the broader issue of what these cartoons represented, since that also seems to be part of the conversation. So I'll leave you with that for now, and hopefully we can get back to that. Great. Thank you. Well, a lot of interesting beginnings of thoughts here because, and I apologize for limiting, for suggesting that you can make your remarks in five minutes because there's more than five minutes worth to say. So let me ask all of you, based on what you've heard from your colleagues, um, what comments you have to say to each other and what ideas that they have stimulated in making you think about it. Does anyone, anything anyone wants to say about that, Ben? Do you? Um, no, I, I know, I know the, uh, I'm more familiar with the laws of, um, the, the prohibitions against image, the use of images in uh, Judaism. And as it's, what it is is, uh, if you, you construct a fence around the image of God to prevent the confusion of dealing with idols, worshiping idols, as opposed to this monotheistic God. So it's, it's an, also an exception, I guess, in the history of the world, the idea of monotheism. So most, uh, historically, most people worshiped everything, you know, animism, they worshiped microphones and everything. So, um, so this, this, um, disturbance about images of uh, Muhammad or Jehovah is already kind of uh, the religion light because the, the real um, fence should uh, prohibit all images and in traditional um, 
cultures that have these prohibitions, they don't use the representational uh, art at all. They use um, other, kind, you know, um, dec uh, geometric art and things. So, uh, one of the arguments of the uh, editor of Charlie Hebdo was, well, so we won't draw Muhammad, and then the more, what happens when the next uh, level of strict uh, image prohibition comes around, and they say, well, you can't draw human beings. And then, then what do we do? Do we stop drawing you? So it was, um, they got themselves in this strange theoretical argument and um, which they could, which they became obsessed with, which uh, is something I, you know, I don't, uh, I don't feel here because I'm not being taken to court for making comic strips on any uh, level. So, um, okay. Yeah. Good. Um, is this working? Hopefully. Uh, I'm, in a way, the great, 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 great grandson of Prophet Muhammad. So in the area we're, we're called Sayyids. Uh, I've, I've tried to get rid of the DNA, I couldn't. Uh, one thing I should say is that one big problem that we have experienced in Iran or in the MENA region is that we want to make anything sacred so nobody could actually talk about it or nobody would actually point fingers or question the authority or, or keep it accountable. So even uh, an ayatollah can become sacred. I drew a crocodile that named rhymed with the name of the ayatollah and I was uh, charged with insulting Islam. So after that, because I wanted to remember that crocodile, I used to wear Lacoste that I'm wearing right now. Lacoste didn't sponsor me for making crocodile famous in Iran, so I'm uh, sponsoring Lacoste by buying its products. But what I'm saying, that the big problem in uh, many uh, communities is that we want to make something sacred so nobody would actually criticize it. That's dangerous. That is dangerous because, okay, we don't want to talk about, let's say, we say that um, Islam is the deen of peace. Yes, we say in the name of God, the most compassionate, the merciful, whenever we want to start something. But we don't want to talk about all the death uh, sentences of people who mocked the prophet with their poetry. There have been many people assassinated from the uh, origins of Islam, from the first years, because they were mocking the prophet, making fun of the prophet. So in a way, what Charlie Abdo cartoonists were doing was somehow similar to that. So if they wanted, if the killers, the, I believe the killers even hadn't seen the cartoons. In my case, hundreds of thousands of people in the Friday prayers all the, around the country were shouting for my death, and my mom had asked one of them, have you seen the cartoon? The lady that was said true no. About, that was true about the Danish Muhammad. Exactly. The people who because marched, they, it was the idea of it. That, yeah, because yeah. They, they just listen to what their imams are saying. And that's a big problem with so many communities that are uh, marginalized. They're, they have marginalized their brains. So what you said, that they, they have to check out the brains, the neuroscientists, yes. I think neuro cartoonist scientists have to check out the brains of those people as well. Good. Yes. Sorry. I just need to jump in for a second. I mean, I take your point about um, the fact that many people uh, react without necessarily having seen the cartoons, but really seeing the cartoons doesn't make you not want to react, right? Because the cartoons themselves are offensive. Depend now the question- Depending. Okay, yeah. no, but let's talk about that, right? Yeah. So let's talk about the Danish cartoons that were uh, the subject of a lot of anger across the spectrum, right? It, I mean, I was angry. I'm not a believing Muslim, right? But I'm angry because I understand what is happening in the Danish context as being a way of attacking a minority, right? And so what was the cartoon? The cartoon, the one cartoon in particular that became iconic was a cartoon that showed Muhammad. So the issue is not, by the way, the, the issue of whether Islam does or does not allow representations of the, the human being or of the prophet. So what is the representation? The representation is Muhammad with a turban that has a bomb in it, okay? So we are not talking about benign cartoons. 
and these like irrational reactions by these fanatical Muslims to things that are just, oh, you know, that things they should be able to shrug off and laugh off. Yes, if we lived in a perfect world, you know, who would care? But we're not living in a perfect world. We're living in a perfect world in which the domestic context of Muslims in North America, in North America and Europe is defined by a minority status that is increasingly precarious, right? Um, and an international context of a war on terror, which has essentially become a war of terror on Muslim populations that shows no sign of ending, right? And let's talk about the Charlie Hebdo, uh, not all of the cartoons. If you haven't seen them, um, I think you really should see them. Um, because first of all, uh, they are not all, all equally offensive. Um, the ones that pertain to Islam are specifically offensive, and they're offensive not theologically, by the way, they're offensive in a very racist sense. And they're, if, even if you want to take race out of it, they're just blanket offensive, okay? So let's talk about, for example, the response of Charlie Hebdo uh, to being told that they could not draw uh, the figure of Muhammad. They drew his ass, his naked ass, and they said, can we draw his ass instead? And the ass is not, is not, by the way, I mean, not that this matters, but it's not like a Renaissance painting, painting of a nice little ass, <laughs> right? <laughs> so these things matter. I mean, this is, this is a way, I mean, and so, you know, I come from a context in which political satire has been an intrinsic part of, of life for us, right? I come from, some, from a country that now, you know, people understand or have come to understand only in terms of intolerance and, and terror, but really we, even now, even today, when um, journalists are consistently under attack, um, we have such a dynamic sort of tradition of political satire, and in cartoons and otherwise. We are quite happy to poke fun at ourselves, right? So this is not an issue of, because a lot of times people say, well, why, you know, Muslims should learn to laugh at themselves. This is not a case of Muslims being asked to laugh at themselves. This is a case of Muslims being, uh, being mocked, right? So we need to make that distinction as well when we talk about this issue of, because sometimes when you talk in generalities in the abstract, the conversation is easy, right? That's what I was trying to say. But when you bring it down to the brass tacks, it becomes a lot more uncomfortable. Yeah, I guess going off of that, what I thought was so interesting about the initial uh, Danish cartoons that were published 10 years ago, um, apparently that whole feature came out because there was a Danish children's book author who was trying to find an illustrator to illustrate a, you know, a respectful history of Mohammed, and he couldn't find anyone to do it, um, of course, because there are these, this taboo against uh, representations. And so... The issue really was this issue of representation, but instead the, uh, the images that were published by Jillens Post in the Danish newspaper were, they, they weren't about this issue of representation actually, they were mocking images that were completely outside of that specific critique. And that's what I found a bit, um, a bit problematic about the images. Um, you know, this image of a, a a turban with a bomb in it, or a, a Mohammed with devil horns, or you know, there were a bunch of representations that had nothing to do with the image that's, or, or the whole issue that supposedly led to the publication of these Mohammeds, and and so that editorially just seemed odd to me. You know, the interesting thing to me is that uh, the analogy between cartoons and the problems that you're all discussing and hate speech. Yeah. And so let me give you a thesis, uh, and I'm interested to know what you think about it. I consider myself a First Amendment absolutist, and I believe that I should have the right to write whatever I want, and if I were a cartoonist, to draw whatever I want. However, as an editor, it would have been inconceivable to me when I was running the nation to publish caricatures of black people with thick lips. And if I were living in Germany and not Jewish in the 1930s, I would not have published the anti, I hope I wouldn't have published the vicious anti-Semitic covers on Der Sturmer. But my question is, in a different culture like Germany in the 1930s, should I have been allowed to publish the Der Sturmer covers when, when they set the image of the Jew and reinforced the anti-Semitism that became the definition of the Jew in Hitler's Germany. So 
what is raised is the question, to me, is the question of what you should be allowed to do under the law. In this country, it's clear to me there should be no censorship, but what you d should do as a matter of moral morality, taste, and judgment as an editor is different to me from what you're permitted to do. Is that a distinction that is useful and does it cross cultural boundaries where it's not useful? So that's my question to the panel. Uh, for me, one thing that comes up even now is uh, some artists that are working in the Netherlands or in Belgium um, will sometimes send illustrations that have representations of black people in them that feel racist to me, and they don't even realize that they're doing it because they don't have the tradition, um, I guess, that we have here in the United States where where that kind of representation is just, uh, you know, provokes this automatic emotional response and, and is not appropriate. Um, and just culturally, I don't think that they, they have the same cultural uh, context. And so it's very interesting to me to still see these kind of depictions come up. And, and I have to, when I'm working with these artists, I have to be very clear that they could be interpreted um, offensively. Um, so, yeah, I'm very, very uh, sensitive about those kind of representations. I think that the comic that Joe Sacco did in response to Charlie Hebdo, um, where he, for example, drew a um, black person falling out a, of a tree with a banana, and he said, you know, as a cartoonist, I can draw whatever I want, but does that mean I should? Um, and I thought that that was a really apt point, and it's something that I, of course, think about as an, an art director and editor. I could, we could editorially publish these things, but should we, um, and why? Uh, I have to agree with some things that Sadia said about the Danish cartoons and what you mentioned about Danish cartoons. We have to see the context, and uh, because I lived in Canada for about seven years and learned a lot of things about multiculturalism over there and how uh, minorities are respected. But on the other hand, uh, we as journalists, I, I believe an editorial cartoonist is a journalist who draws. But uh, there are magazines, there are publications that uh, are not, they don't follow the rules. Are we supposed to shut them down? I don't think so. In what context are we going to see them? The same context that they are representing themselves. Do we have to buy them? No, we don't have to buy them. Do we have to, uh, let's say, point fingers at the governments of why they haven't banned them? Like what the Iranian government or, or different governments in the Middle East told the Danish government in 2006? No. In Iran, they banned Danish cheese. They, they, they even changed the name of Danish pastry. They call it the Mohammadi flour pastry after that. <laughs> so it's, it's playing with words. But one, one thing I want to say and I want to point out, Regardless of what anybody draws, are we supposed to justify the assassination of people? No, I know nobody does that. But this, there is this conversation in different countries in the MENA region that, oh, it's in a way justified. On the other hand, the Iranian government is now sponsoring a cartoon contest to deny, to, in a way, deny the Holocaust in response to the uh, Charlie Hebdo cartoons. So you see that the, there is a reaction over there that's weird. Um, what I want to just point out is that we, as journalists, we have to, in a way, obey the principles of journalism. As an editorial cartoonist, I do obey those rules. But I'm not supposed to uh, censor or uh, si bring silence to other cartoonists who do not want to obey those rules. That's what I think. Okay. Uh, is there can, anyone else who wants to talk? Can I quickly yeah, interject? To that point. I, I mean, I think the way that you phrase the um, question, Ben, um, sort of brings us to the main problem, which is, um, is, is, sort, is, is liberalism facing its own um, contradictions, right? Uh, and let me sort of uh, play out what I mean by that. So. Again, as I said, in an ideal world, um, yes, you would have absolute freedom, or should have absolute freedom, uh, even from self-censorship, to say what you want, right? Um, 
But what we have instead is the problem that on the one hand you have the realm of civil society, right? Um, which is supposed to be the realm of equality and um, all of these uh, civil rights. Um, and, and the idea there being that everyone within civil society is, is equal, right? But then you have the realm of political society in which everybody is not equal, right? And so you have to contend with the issue of social power. Right? And then once you start to contend with the issue of social power, then you get into even more tricky terrain, right? which is, OK, so then if we don't like what um, a magazine publishes, then we don't have to buy it or circulate those images. right? But uh, what happens when that magazine or those images are uh, produce ideas that are shared by the majority of the population, right? which tends to be the, the dominant group in society, like, for example, um, in, in Europe, right? So they will circulate these images entirely unconscious um, of the fact that they are racist. And that also is interesting to me, because there, uh, what you have to pay attention to is why is it that we have this particular lexicon of race and representation that Europe doesn't, because it's not as if Europe doesn't have a history with race and racism, right? Um, it has a very racist colonial history. Um, in which it also has a history of racist depictions and representations of its colonial populations. The difference is that whereas the US has had to deal with its racial others um, for a very long time domestically at home, and those racial others have over time at least pushed back to some degree, right? And the civil rights movement was one very important aspect of that, that really, I think, um, has consolidated our idea of what is acceptable right, to say um, and not to say when we're talking about race. But Europe has only recently been contending with this racial others coming home to live domestically. And so it's, you know, the dominant group in, in European society sees no problem with publishing. And I'm not sure that they don't understand them as racist. I think they probably do. I don't think it's an unconscious. Some, I mean, in the case of what you were talking, probably, probably a lot of it is unconscious. Um, and, but that doesn't sort of put it beyond critique either, right? Uh, just because something is unconscious doesn't mean we don't get to point it out and critique it. So maybe, um, you know, and, and of course, one doesn't want to advocate giving the state any more power than it already has, because what it ends up doing with that power is not um, imposing it unilaterally or uh, equally across the entire population, but using it to target sp its specific um, enemies at any given time. So maybe the way to deal with it is to um, allow for at least a vociferous critique when things come out. And I think that was one of the points I was trying to make is that in the wake of uh, the attack on Charlie Hebdo, even critiquing the content of the cartoons uh, became conflated with justifying the horrible um, murders of the cartoonists, right? So we have to get beyond that as well. Uh, did you want well, to say something, Ben? Oh, no, I, I just know that in the, um, in the 30s, um, the, the, you know, caricature and the whole idea of uh, trying to say something about a person's character from their features, physiognomy, that's pseudoscience, which is probably the basis of all, it was a scientific basis for racism in Europe, that if you're, you're uh, profile wasn't uh, perpendicular. As it slanted back, you were less uh, intelligent. That's a real pseudoscience. Um, well, the thing is that in the 30s, caricatures of Jews in the Yiddish humor magazines to uh, uh, you know, a man from Mars would be indistinguishable from the cartoons in a Nazi a propaganda magazine. They're caricatures. And you know they're trading on the idea of um, exaggerated features, and in that sense, um, context is what makes one, you know, anti-Semitic, uh, and the other one a comedy about Jews. And and um, so anyway, the tragedy is that the, these cartoons are not driving people to say, well, why can't why don't um, why is there this, um, you know, this underclass in France that can't get these cartoons? And what is it about our educational system that's not bringing that? And they're not saying that. It's being used as a, you know, 
as a, uh, an excuse to continue a war on terror. So it's just a bad, it's not trying to bring people up to understand the caricatures are meant to be like all language. If you don't, know, I mean, you can misread um, language, you can misread things. And I don't think to say they're inherently racist because they're exaggerated physiognomy, I think is, it's part of caricature. I mean, I, don't, I think you could be insulted by um, any drawing by a cartoonist because if you're personally caricatured, you'd say, why did he give me such a big nose? I don't have such a big, I mean, and then it's, anyway, that's, that's the, just the reality of that, that tradition of drawing, which is maybe stupid and it may be an exaggeration is a stupid thing to do. And they should, the one, the cartoon that, that was pointed out in the trial in 2007, that was one of the, they only, they picked uh, these self-appointed uh, represent, representatives of the Muslim community, picked only three cartoons that they said uh, mocked uh, Muslims in general. And the, it was the one with the uh, turban bomb. And they said that's because it was the most naturalistic. It was the least cartoony. Mm -hmm. And that's even more offensive <coughs> to us because it says this is not in fun. And um, so. Uh, it was a non cartoon in a way. Yeah, it's because it wasn't a, car a cartoony depiction of a Muslim. So, um, uh, you know, it's a simple. That cartoon is a simplistic argument. And I think a lot of political cartoons, I don't do political cartoons for that reason. I, and I don't do single panel cartoons. I do multiple panel cartoons where you can build an argument and maybe even critique your own punchline. I don't, I don't do single panel <laughs> cartoons for that reason. I don't think they are subtle enough to talk about things in this imperfect world, but you know. Well, I, I want to ask, I have a theory, which I'm interested in your comments on, that one of the reasons that people get so upset about cartoons, and especially caricature, as you're discussing, is that they are, by definition, unfair. They are exaggerations. And there is no way, if you don't like an editorial, you can write an answer, a letter to the editor, even if it's only in your head. But if you, you are the victim of a caricature or you identify with someone who is the victim of a caricature or a cartoon, there is no such thing as a cartoon to the editor unless you happen to be a cartoonist. So you have this, so you have this frustration because there is no way to answer visual language the way there is to answer traditional language and verbal language. And that, this leads to a feeling of impotence and rage. So that's my, that's my thing. And then there's the additional worry, the suspicion that the caricatures may have caught the real you or the real ugly person underneath the caricature, the reality, the existential reality of it. So put all those things together and it results in this emotional explosion. So that's my thesis, what do you think of that? I have something for that. For people who cannot draw cartoons, we have created a platform. It's called tunistan.com. So Tunistan is a land of tunes. You can go there, you can, uh, there are a lot of uh, pre-drawn characters. You can register, go in and uh, make your cartoons, add uh, captions, there are caption balloons, and make fun of the people over there. Or you can even cut pictures, right. put them there, and uh, send your critique to the editors. So there is a way, but right. we're working on it, and we're going to create an app for this. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes, caricature is so interesting because psychologically it seems to capture a, a truth about uh, an appearance. Um, I think what be becomes problematic is sometimes when, when those images become repeated and repeated and repeated and then uh, kind of go into the realm of, of stereotype. Um, so it's not so much that, you know, certain images of of you know highlighting a large nose and having that be a Jewish depiction, um, maybe that's 
could in one sense be based on a truth about one person's uh, appearance, but then when it gets repeated and generalized, um, that's when it becomes problematic. You know, I think about, for example, the, the famous Barry Blitt cover of, of the Obamas fist bumping mm -hmm. as terrorists, and there was a lot of debate about that image, about whether that was um, propagating a stereotype or critiquing a stereotype. And it was really unclear, and I think that there's some, you know, this debate about caricature and and physio you know, physio uh, how, how we look that is getting in the same sort of territory. When is it propagating a stereotype and when is it a stereotype? Right. I don't know how many of the audience are familiar with that cartoon. It was a famous New Yorker cover which showed Obama and his wife, Michelle, doing a fist bump wearing terrorist garb and uh, Blit, the cartoonist, meant uh, there were thousands of cancellation of subscriptions and a lot of denunciations of the of the caricature and the cartoon. And David Remnick explained people were misunderstanding its intent. Its intent had to do with uh, a critique of the people who held that view, the distorted view that the Obamas were terrorists rather than a critique of the Obamas. And uh, what, what you're saying, it's not the only time, as you know, that cartoons have been misunderstood. Uh, the other, another New Yorker cover, it showed a Hasid kissing a, a Caribbean woman, and there were protests all over Brooklyn about it, and um, so there can be that misunderstanding. But let me ask a, a final question of can you. Can I just actually, yes, before of course. you go, yes. I just want to um, talk a little bit about what this, um, focusing on the form of the, the cartoon um, brings up. Um, because part of it is about this function of humor, right? Um, and um, actually, before I go there, just I'll lose this thread, but I think it might be interesting that um, maybe things like protests and uh, censure of particular uh, or, or misreadings or, or, or readings of cartoons or um, uh, of uh, pictures that the the artist never intended right like for example the obama fist bump or whatever maybe the outrage or the anger or the debate over um, that misreading is a way in which society learns that this is actually racist right so how is one if especially if one belongs to the dominant group how is one to realize what the impact of one's depiction is going to how that's going to resonate with the people being depicted right um, so maybe this is, a, you know, not violence, but contentious debate is actually a good thing. It should not be understood. And I think too often, I'm not saying that we are understanding it that way, but too often in, in the discussions that I've been forced to have, it appears as if um, taking these things seriously and, and talking about them and, and critiquing them is read as an act of censorship in and of itself, right? Rather than something that is essential to a democratic society or to the principles um, that we, of, of civil liberties that we actually hold dear. Secondly, I think just to throw out again the issue of um, when we're talking about cartoons, and, and because sometimes we talk about cartoons in a general sense and then we switch to talking about specific cartoons, in this case, and about Islam and Muslims. And really, I, I cannot stress enough that the issue, you talk to anybody, the issue is not the form, although, of course, everyone recognizes um, racist caricatures. Everybody has those codes by now, right? What does a hook nose signify? And interestingly, I mean, Edward Said used to point this out, that European racism has basically wholesale taken um, these depictions, uh, these anti-Semitic uh, tropes, and you started using them for um, anti-Muslim racism. Like, it's amazing. In fact, um, you should, if you, if you go back and look at the sort of range of Charlie Hebdo um, covers and cartoons, you'll see, too, in which it's the exact same profile, exact same caricature of the hook nose. In one case, it's meant to represent um, a Jew, and in one case, it represents a Muslim. So, you know, it's kind of interesting to think about how those things are playing out and how that is part of, um, how we need to understand that as part of uh, Europe's own form of racism, history of racism, right? And um, today and yesterday and all of that. Um, 
Anyway, I'll leave it at that. And uh, I should add that that, that has caused uh, many cosmetic surgeons in the North Africa and uh, uh, Middle East region to get richer and richer to get rid of this uh, racist factor so the cartoons will actually be different. But I have to tell everyone that nobody's nose is too big. Other parts of the face are too small. That's why <laughs> we make this mistake. Cartoonist speaks. Very helpful, and, and I think the idea that it, the job is to stimulate the debate is very important. Uh, on the Hasid kissing the Caribbean woman that caused the New Yorker all kinds of problems, Tina Brown wrote an explanation of it in the issue because she saw the problems coming. Uh, what Art Spiegelman, who did the cartoon, said when people attacked it for being racist, why don't you show an African-American male kissing a, a white woman rather than the other. He said, if I did that, I would be accused of claiming that the African-Americans are trying to rape the white women. And he said, I, what I was trying to show was a Valentine's Day cover, people of different races instead of at each other's throats, at each other's lips. So that was his explanation. So let me ask a final question of the panel, but invite the audience now to join the conversation. We have microphones on both sides of both aisles, and line up if you have questions for the panel. And I'll ask a final question. And um, it's a question, it's about the New York Times decision not to, but it's not aimed at our panelist from the New York Times who has told us she was not involved in the, de the decision, but it's, it's for everybody. And it's a question, to me, it's a question of categories. I think the Times and CNN and other news media which chose not to publish or to republish the Charlie Hebdo caricatures or back then, 10 years ago, the Danish Mohammeds, because they, they have as a general policy not to needlessly offend groups of people and especially minority groups of people. I think that's a legitimate decision to make on the one hand, on the other hand, my hypothesis would be that that's a reason not to run a, a op-ed piece maybe or a news story about it, but that this is different because it's a subject of a news article and you can't paraphrase a cartoon any more than you can paraphrase a poem and convey its emotional power. So if you want to educate your readers about what the argument is about, it's not enough to just describe it, you have to show it. So that's a hypothesis. I'm interested in the panel's view about that, but I also want to invite the audience into this discussion. So if anyone yeah. wants to talk I mean, about I'm that. I'm offended by most of the ads in the New York Times. Good. So nobody, <laughs> nobody's saying don't, you know, I wish right. they, they didn't need to depend on those companies to subsidize the news. And, um, but anyway, but, Good. Yeah, okay. uh, I, I had this discussion with the editor of uh, Toronto Star on a radio show, and uh, they said that we're talking about the cartoon, or as the Canadians say, about the cartoon, <laughs> but uh, we don't publish it. So I said, okay, how could, uh, if I were a blind individual, how would I have learned about the cartoon? It's, it's weird that you're telling a story about a cartoon. And then there is a cartoon. So in the context, it's, I think in reporting the, uh, the whole story, they could have published at least one of the non-offensive cartoons. Of course, to many Muslims, anything is offensive. But I think uh, it wasn't a good idea. I, uh, I, I think some, uh, there should have been a way for uh, telling the story in a better way, because I think the, media, the media's role is to tell the story, not to hide a part of the story and then say, we hit this because of this and this and this and this. So I think uh, it would have been a better idea to publish at least one cartoon that had caused the whole debate. Great. Thank you. I, I think where the New York Times came down in, in terms of that is the argument was that, okay, so it would be good to publish at least one cartoon but the fact is, is that one cartoon doesn't actually tell the whole story. So to tell the whole story, you actually need to publish all of them, and you need to publish the most offensive ones. Mm -hmm. and, and publishing the most offensive ones actually, um, therefore, um, you know, 
put you at, at risk of offending a whole entire community. Um, and so it does become this issue of storytelling. Uh, does one tell the whole story? And, and I think the Times decided that it didn't. Um, how it dealt with it digitally was that they were just one click away, which becomes sort of this other interesting debate about traditional print media versus digital media. Um, and, and that the decision actually that was made had more to do with what was going to appear in print rather than what was going to appear online. And so it seems like now the digital world is, is maybe going to come up with some new rules about how, how things will be displayed online when, when these issues keep on coming up. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a tough question. And given that images have power, and every time we circulate them, in some sense, we are contributing to the power that they have. Um, but I, I, take, I take the point about how to tell the story without giving all the background, so to speak, right? And, and also the fact that um, really this is an issue of, of print media because, and, and maybe broadcast media, because uh, for everyone else, even if the Times or whoever didn't link to it, the stuff is everywhere, right? Um, so I think that's, that's sort of almost a moot point, I think. Um, I think um, the, the issue is broadly also about, and this is, you know, this is really, I think, where we kind of run into a problem. Um, again, with, with sort of the limits of liberalism, right? Is that, yes, um, I don't get offended by a lot of things, um, and I might get offended by other things, but I think being attentive not just to the content of what we're talking about, to the context. So let me play this out for you. Um, I think it's very different to, say, have uh, the kinds of images uh, mocking uh, Christians that Charlie Hebdo ran in uh, Europe, right? But I would have huge problems if those images were published in Pakistan, because in Pakistan, or in India for, for that matter, because both in India and Pakistan, the context completely changes. You're talking about places where Christians are a persecuted minority. Right? And so, again, I want to take the conversation out of this narrow thing of this is about Muslims and these cartoons about, because we keep moving back and forth between the broader issues of cartoons and what cartoons represent and images represent. And when we become sort of more focused, it's just all about Muslims and Islam. And um, I think thinking about it in a broader sense in terms of context and what kinds of things, even, um, you know, and we've talked about that, that are just simply not considered in good taste to say or represent um, in the US, even though we know that the US it remains a deeply racist country, right? So I think th those are the kinds of things that I'm left with. Right. I just want to add one small thing. Yes. Um, uh, I think if the storytelling would have been the way that Sadia mentioned the ass, that would have been very helpful. Of course, I was waiting for a beep because mm -hmm. when you use the, oh, the yeah. yeah, in Iran, if, if they they wanted to censor, uh, astronomy would have had a problem. Astrology would have a problem. Network media, everything yeah, with AS. So. But uh, on the other hand, I'm not sure if if uh, newspapers, publications in the West had published the cartoons, would they have kept their sponsors, or would big companies in the Middle East? actually paid for their ads anymore or not? That, that would have been another question mm -hmm. that nobody wants to talk about it as well. Great, thank you. All right, I now want to invite the audience, if you have questions or comments, first gentlemen and tell us who you are and then ask your question or make your comment. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Adam Carroll. I work within the Muslim community on different issues, civil liberties uh, included. Um, yeah, I appreciate the conversation. Um, it may not be taking place in our mosques so much, and, as, and perhaps it should, but it is taking place in Muslim Facebook exchanges quite a bit, um, this question of values. Um, I appreciate that Sadia Tour brought up uh, power and race and context, and I think that that is very important to keep in mind. Um, Questions of, dis I have a question about discrimination, and discrimination has different meanings, obviously. The I stimulation wanted, of the... Of uh, discrimination. Discrimination, we sh should we discriminate between different types of speech? Uh, for example, uh, I could get up here and um, call you all names. Okay, that's a kind of speech. Um, perhaps I have the right, 
but it's disruptive. So when does incitement and hate come into the calculation of whether it should be protected? Uh, a, a case in point, uh, Pamela Geller's Islamophobic ads in the uh, subways, uh, not just in New York, but in San Francisco, Washington, you know, around the country. Um, they're also defamatory, they're incorrect. Uh, the, one, one of those ads is currently uh, being litigated. You know, it's a, it's a complicated question uh, whether this is helpful. So do we discriminate also between advertisement and, um, you know, this says fear of art. Well, art is a great thing by definition, but propaganda and advertisement isn't. So that's my question. Good, good. And uh, I'll add to it. Uh, what is the visual equivalent of Justice Holmes' line, we're all for free speech, but you shouldn't be allowed to shout fire in a crowded theater. Uh, so anyway, thank you for the question. And panelists, you have response to that? You've got <laughs> silence. You stumped us. <laughs> yeah, I think some of these problems are arising because of the idea of you know, pantomime images, images that should be, don't need commentary. And who says they do? They don't. I don't think most images mean anything without a commentary. And okay. if it's missing the commentary, it's open to um, complete mis... Uh, okay. It can be misunderstood with the commentary. But okay. without it, it's a complete... Um, just throwing this thing out into the world right. and hoping people get your point. But... Uh, and these, you know, you're talking about really complex and sensitive <laughs> issues. Why not be as uh, clear as you can be? And, and Thank you. Question. Hi, I'm Kathleen McQueen, and I'm an arts writer. And I'd like to address the issue. I mean, first, I'd like to thank the panel for opening up the complexity of the issue. And... Um, and how multifaceted it is. And then I'd like to address the kind of singular graphic of the fear of art and our beginning point of the fear of art, but take it around to the other side of that. Is perhaps it less about fear and more about manipulation or use of art as an easy target for broader cultural battles? Um, if we think back to 1989, 1990 in this country and the culture wars, what we came to be known as the culture wars, art was really being manipulated to talk about broader social issues and that be had become politicized. Panel? Any thoughts about oh, that? Sure, the, the right wing in France loved this whole event in uh, Charlie Hebdo because it gave them all the uh, justification cracking down on, uh, you know, Muslim behavior in, in every way. So, yeah, they didn't say, let's uh, talk about free speech. And what, I mean, so it's, uh, yeah, I think you can't, it's easily misused by, uh, as propaganda for different groups. Any other comments on that observation? Thank you. Over here, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Yashika Dutt and I'm a student at Columbia, and also a journalist from Delhi, and thank you for the wonderful and nuanced discussion that we had today. I identify a lot with what Ms. Tu just said, and I wanted you to comment on something that I thought about when we were discussing the issue, is that does religion mean something entirely different to people from that part of the world as it does to people in this part of the world? Because I, uh, when I saw the cartoons, I'm Hindu, but I felt the same way pretty much, the, the sense of offense and the racial, the racial subtext, it wasn't lost on me either. So uh, I, I feel that uh, people in India and in Pakistan depend and hold religion more dearly than maybe Westerners do. So I wanted Ms. Tour to comment on that and probably tell us a little bit about why, if, if we were offended, and if a lot of people in India and Pakistan both were offended, why there is a deeper meaning and context there than what just is being discussed? Um, that's, a great, 
Sorry, that's a great question. Um, the thing is that obviously it requires a response that I can't really flesh out here because it's not a simple matter of saying yes, they do, right? Um, I think that uh, religion also often, um, precisely because of a particular history of racialized colonialism, has come to mean something different, uh, quite aside from the you know, issue of theology and, and your relationship uh, between, between you and your faith, right? But really um, has locked us into a particular kind of, of uh, racial landscape, right? Where uh, talking about, say in the, in the case of the subcontinent in particular, um, you're not just talking about issues of faith and communities of faith, but particular kinds of um, sort of sedimented identities, right? And then, and that really has come out of our colonial heritage, right? Because the way the, coloni the colonial state basically decided that the most important way to distinguish between the different people in the subcontinent was on the basis of their religion, right? And then it codified all of that um, in various laws. And as these, you know, as, as a sociologist, this is the kind of stuff I look at, is how uh, then these things take on a life of, lives of their own, right? So often what I think appears to be about religion is about politics, and not because, you know, those people out there can't separate politics from religion, but because religion, not the religion itself, but how religion works um, is a deeply politicized thing. Right? particularly not just in the subcontinent, because we really are um, and have been, at least from the point, from the time that we were colonized, part of a broader world, not community necessarily, but whenever just acting in a local context, right? These things are always sort of playing out in a much broader sense. Um, so that's my sort of short answer to your question. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, sure. Hi, um, my name is Adam. I'm, I kind of consider myself a free speech absolutist. I wrote about in Israel in defense of um, David Irving, the um, supposed Holocaust denier. Um, but I completely agree with uh, uh, Ms. Tor about the importance of co uh, context sensitivity and the, the elements of politics that go into it. My problem is that you say that we don't look at the broader context or the bro not broader context, but the um, the broader meanings of it and the sensitivity, uh, and we don't talk about why the cartoons were offensive. But the fact is that for years, Charlie Hebdo has been have been publishing cartoons that have been offensive to all to a variety of people, including a cartoon showing a rabbi kissing a Nazi soldier that I think Boel accounts is very offensive. The only reason we are having this discussion now is because of the tragedy. And I, I just want your thought about that. Hey, Charlie Hebdo has been taken to court infinitely, like a dozen times by the uh, Catholic groups in France for making fun of the Pope and the church. So, and I think just once by the Muslim community in 2007. So, um, uh, you know, I mean, the, the context that I think with, people are talking about is the, um, the uh, you know, militarization of the world. And if you talk about, um, and I mean, and these are the, when you talk about attacking minorities, you're talking about minorities in those countries, because uh, Mus the, 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 this Islamic faith is a very large, it's not, I don't know if it's which, how it ranks in world religions, is it the? Second. The second, yeah. So it's not a hardly a minority religion. So I don't think it's about, um, and you know, and, and I think it's about people critiquing crit, the critique of religion. The, the people at Charlie Hebdo are very um, anti-religion, the idea of religion, and their way of doing it may not be a very subtle way of critiquing it. And I think there is a, a, a real critique. Why do people need religion? Why does it, is it very popular among uh, poor people as a substitute for other interests and hobbies? And um, that's, I think, that's, I think, the bigger uh, 
question. And and uh, so anyway, I know, but they've been, no, they, it's a law, a magazine has been in business for a long time and has offended everyone in France. It, it just hasn't been, there have been lawsuits, and there, but there haven't been, um, uh, executions for what? That's a difference, oh, wow. I think. The Pope didn't send right. a Swiss card, so. Yeah, right. I mean, that uh, seems like maybe not a commensurate punishment to us to kill somebody for um, making, uh, making fun of a god. But uh, that's. Okay, this has been a great discussion. I want to know if any of the panelists have a concluding thought that they want to share with us. Well, uh, we got it. one more last question yeah. over Have there, and then uh, invite the panelists. You can always ignore it. it. That'll make it quick. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make one comment and then a question. Uh, I want to call people's attention to the article in The Nation recently, which I thought was a very uh, good article in terms of perspective on Charlie Hebdo, because it pointed out that the number of articles attack, the number of cartoons attacking Muslims far outnumbered those attacking other groups, uh, and that was published in The Nation. That was just one of the important points that she made. My question is, or my comment, or whatever we have time for, I think freedom of speech is a complete myth. I'm an art critic and an art historian, and I write about politically engaged art. And I see how artists want to position themselves within the uh, capitalist society. They are silently censoring themselves all the time. Now, cartoons are in a special category, and maybe they see themselves as privileged to have more freedom of speech, but I do think freedom of speech is a myth. Could you comment on that? I agree. Thoughts? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, based on my experience in Iran, in Iran we had freedom of speech. We didn't have freedom after speech. <laughs> And some, some people uh, actually believe in freakdom of speech. <laughs> so that's the big problem. Uh, yes, we love freedom of speech. It's, we are looking for absolute freedom of speech. We haven't found it yet. Hopefully we'll do, or other generations will do. But I think the idea of absolute freedom of speech is something beautiful. It's paradise. And of course, if they don't throw you out of paradise for taking the apple of, let's say, uh, Steve Jobs, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, everybody should have unlimited money to support their political party, but they don't. So that's, you know, that's a, that's a freedom of speech issue, uh, Citizens mm -hmm. United. And if in a perfect world, I'd have an equal amount of money to give to another, to the Green Party, but I don't have it. So. Right. So we're shut out, yeah. basically. So, so it's. Um, so I mean, I think um, I was being uh, obviously. I didn't mean to just dismiss what you said. I take seriously what you said, and um, that was what I was trying to argue too. That num on the one hand, um, we don't anywhere have freedom of speech, right? We don't have it here. Um, most of us may not realize that because we are part, unconsciously or not, um, of the dominant mainstream or are positioned such that things that we say uh, will not offend the power structure, right? And especially now we're talking about the national security state, right? So the minute they can like slap terrorism on you um, and no guess, you know, no no prizes for guessing who gets to gets that label, right? Um, you get to, you get to have your freedoms taken away, right? Um, but even if even if um, we could actually have um, absolute freedom of speech. I think we need to think about what happens uh, when you impose that, and this was my, my argument about um, civil society versus political society. What happens when you impose an absolutist freedom of speech in a society that is riven through with, um, with power inequalities, right? So it matters, when I was talking about context, one way in which I tried to draw that out was talking about how um, you know, anti-Catholic or anti-Christian cartoons in uh, Europe or North America have a very different valence from anti-Christian cartoons in my part of the world, right? But also, even within, say, our country, um, here, the US, um, who is making fun of whom depends on their relative po positions of power, right? So, 
you know, this, and you also come up against then often uh, a complete failure of, of, uh, of speech, of language. Um, as in, for example, if you want to respond in an adequately uh, racist way to a racist statement made to you, so if someone calls me a raghead, someone white calls me a raghead, what's the best I can offer? Cracker? Doesn't have the same valence, right? Because it doesn't carry the, the history of race, and it doesn't come laden with those histories of power um, that are al also already operating. So that, I think, really is what I, what I want, or I'm constantly trying to think through is, that how is it possible? Of course, you want to hold on to the ideals of civil liberties, but you, an ap, in an absolutist sense, but you also want to constantly recognize that they assume that um, they assume a polity that is equal, right? But which actually is not. So, what do we do with that? On that note, I want to thank the panelists for a great panel in, in anthropology, religion, capitalism, aesthetics, and all the rest. As well as the audience.